The author of this story, Isaiah Spiegel, is a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto and of the Nazi concentration camps. The story is entitled, A Ghetto Dog. Anna Nikolaevna, widow of Jacob Simon Temkin, the fur dealer, had only time enough to snatch up a small framed photograph of her husband. For the German was already standing in the open doorway shouting, Raus! All the while, Nicky, the widow's dog, had been lying near one of the heavy doors, dozing and dreaming an old dog's dream, his pointed muzzle resting on his outstretched paws. He was well along in years. His coat was shedding, and light patches showed in its sandy hue. His legs were weak, but his big eyes, brownish with a blue glint, reminded one that he too had once been a puppy. The widow and her dog led a lonely life. Nicky wandered through the rooms on his weak stumpy legs, his head drooping, his whining quieted by weary thoughts. After his master's death, the widow used to listen all day to Nicky moving through the stillness of the house. He had refused for several days to leave the bed where his master had died. Whenever she sat by the table, and Nicky was in the bedroom opposite, it seemed to her as though her late husband were again walking through the bedroom in his house slippers. Between the widow and her dog, there had formed a mesh of otherworldly thoughts and dreams. She saw in his drooping old head, in his worn-out fur, and his pupils with their blue glints, a shadow of her husband. Perhaps this was because Nicky had been close to his master for so many years, and had been ready to lay down his life for him, or perhaps because with time he had taken on his master's soft tread over the rugs, his master's lax mouth and watery eyes. Whichever it was, the widow had never clasped the dog's head without feeling some inner disquiet. Between them there was that bond which sometimes springs up between two lonely creatures, one human and the other brute. While the German was still in the open doorway, and before the widow had time to snatch up the photograph, Nicky had already taken his stand at the threshold. He raised his old head against the German, opened his mouth wide to reveal his few remaining teeth, let out three wild howls, and was set to leap straight for the German's throat. Suddenly the dog had shed his ears, and it let his legs straightened, and hot saliva drooled from his muzzle. The German at the door became confused for a moment. Taken aback by the fire glinting in the old dog's eyes, he clutched at his pistol holster. Have pity, the old woman quavered. It's only a poor animal. With her whole body, she shielded Nicky from the German and at the same time began patting the dog. In a moment, he lay quiet and trembling in the old woman's arms. At last, the widow tugged at his leash and the two of them made their way through the dark hallway into the street. As she hurried through the hallway, she seized a small black cane with a silver knob Without this cane, a memento of her husband, she could hardly take a step. The widow found herself in a narrow, squalid street in the Balu district of Lodz, where all the hack drivers, porters, and emaciated Jewish streetwalkers lived. It was late at night before everyone was assigned quarters in the district, and the widow was taken to the room of a tart known as Big Rose, a very much disgruntled tart who did not want a dog in the house. It's enough I have to take in an old lady, she kept yelling. What do I need a sick old hound for? Through the small dark hallway, the widow and the dog reached the deserted balcony. Below them lay a tangle of dark Baloo streets. See there, Nicky. Over there, there. That's our house. Our street. The dog lifted his head and stood up on his hind legs and peered into the darkness. For a while he stood thus, with the widow's arms around him. 
Then suddenly let out a howl. It rent the sky like lightning, beat against the clouds, and then died away in the cold darkness of the earth. From the day Big Rose bound the open wounds the dog got by crawling through the barbed wire strung around the ghetto, from that day, her attitude toward the widow had undergone a complete change. She took down the red hangings that had divided the room in two and asked the old woman to leave her dark nook and share the room with her. All three of them, the two women and the dog, now used the sofa. Nikki lay propped up by the colored cushions, lost in an old dog's dream. This all happened just about the time when the Germans issued an order that all animals, horses, dogs, goats, and dogs, must be turned over to them. The horses and cows were to be taken into the city, but the dogs were to be immediately shot in a field close to the marketplace. At daybreak, Big Rose threw a torn black shawl with long fringes over her, and the widow, without uttering a word, took Nicky on his leash with one hand and her small silver knob cane in the other. Both women were going to take the dog to the marketplace. Big Rose kept mauling her cheeks and softly weeping. The widow's disheveled hair, gray and lifeless, hung over her ashen face. The compulsory surrender of her dog had come as such a shock to the widow that at first, when Big Rose had shouted the news into her face, she had clutched her head with her withered fingers and had remained still for several minutes. Big Rose thought the old woman had died, standing with her fingers in her hair and her eyes not even blinking. She just stood there, stunned and stone cold. The dog let them do with him whatever they liked. He dropped at their feet and held his pointed head up to them, then yawned and let his muzzle sink to the cold floor. The two women started out through the small courtyard, Nicky on his long leash between them. The snow was coming down in flakes as slender and chill as needles and stabbed their hands, their faces, and the dog's fur. It was bitter cold. By the time the widow and Big Rose approached the pound with Nicky, it was full of Jewish dogs. They were jammed together, huddled in twos and threes, their heads resting on one another's shoulders. Perhaps they did this because of the cold, which beat down upon them from the sky. The widow and Big Rose halted before the German. He waited for the old woman to let go of the leash. But instead of letting go, she wound the leash still tighter about her wrist and even her forearm. She did this with her eyes closed, the way a Jew winds the straps of a phylactery on his forearm. The German snatched at the leash. The widow staggered on her old legs, since Nikki was by now pulling her into the pound. She let herself be dragged along. In the meantime, the German kicked the gate shut. His loud, tinny laughter ran along the barbed wire.